righteousness like you I shall church. Good to see you here this morning. We're going to go ahead and uh, sing our first hymn this morning. Take your hymn books. Let's go to hymn number 621. Who is on the Lord's side? Hymn number 621. Let's go ahead and stand as we sing. Oh. 
enjoyed singing this morning. Bob Neff, will you let us, uh, open us in a word of prayer? from Baltimore here this morning. It's good to have you folks with us today. Do we have any other visitors here this morning? I don't think I missed anybody, but anybody else that's visiting? We'll make sure we get you a visitor card, but appreciate you guys visiting with us while you're in uh, Central Pennsylvania. So thank you for being here for that. Uh, by way of announcements, a few things that I'm going to talk about. So we, uh, you know, we have our Senior Saints prayer meeting at 10 o'clock on Tuesday. Uh, don't forget about the quarterly business meeting coming up on Wednesday night, the 17th. Uh, the quarterly reports are on the hall table back there. So if you want to grab one of those, make sure uh, you, you understand that. But we'll be having our quarterly business meeting on the 17th. The next announcement we're going to make, we've, we've altered a bit um, because of the amount of missionaries that we had coming. Uh, we only had two missionaries coming. One was a scheduling conflict or a mix up there. Uh, and Joel and Brooke were not able to join us. So <clears throat> because of that, uh, we're, going to, we're going to just have a Missions Emphasis Sunday uh, on the 21st. So I do want to let you guys know that. We'll make some more announcements about what that is. But we'll one missionaries in Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night. Uh, and we'll talk about that as, uh, next week and the details of what we're going to do. But we did change that back from the full week just because of a couple, uh, a couple holes that we had uh, as far as missionaries being here. But we'll let you know about uh, the details uh, further to come next Sunday. Also, we're having a church work day scheduled for Saturday, May 4th. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet available for that if you can come help us out. Uh, you know, as the old saying goes, many hands make light work. So if you could do a little bit of something, we appreciate the help. Uh, there are, you know, a number of jobs that need done. Not everybody has to be on a ladder cleaning chandeliers. We'll find something if you can help us out, but appreciate that. Uh, and then uh, don't forget about ladies, the ladies banquet coming up on uh, Saturday, May 11th. Uh, Jocelyn Terrell will be with us as our guest speaker. Uh, and there's a sign-up sheet available for that. So if you have not signed up, ladies, please do that. Uh, I, I, know you'll, I, I know you'll enjoy Mrs. Terrell. 
Uh, some of you may remember her from when she's been here before, but I guarantee you, you'll want to be here for it. And uh, if you can, invite somebody to come with you. Uh, it's a good time to bring folks in, and uh, you know, it's a good time to uh, have some visitors come, get an introduction uh, to the church. So just take advantage of that, if you will, and uh, appreciate that. Well, we're going to sing another hymn this morning. Go to hymn number 471. 471, He the Pearly Gates Will Open. Love divides the great and wondrous, deep and mighty truths of life, coming from the heart of Jesus, just the same through tests of time. He the pearly gates will open, so
mention one thing to you. I forgot about mentioning this this morning in Sunday school, but it's better that everybody's here. Make sure you read in the front of your uh, bulletin here. We got an update from uh, the Deku family, from Joel and Brooke, uh, just particularly on Bennett. So it does say in here Bennett is, is slowly improving, but he still has a ways to go. So they're down in Tennessee. Now Joel and Brooke kind of switch places because she has to be back out at uh, the uh, Passage Northwest. They have their annual Pastor's Wise Retreat. Uh, so Joel didn't exactly fit the bill there, wasn't going to be helpful, so <laughs> they switched spots. Joel went to Tennessee to be with Bennett, um, so they kind of flip-flopped, but, but if you would, please just continue to pray. I know most of you have been, uh, maybe all of you have been, I hope, uh, but again, they, they are our missionaries, and uh, they're all our missionaries, but Joel and Brooke are just a little bit special in that regard, so if you would really this week just continue to pray. Um, you know, it's good that he's had some relief, and we certainly praise the Lord for that. Uh, but let's really pray the Lord to heal that situation and take care of it. I, I don't know the exact long-term impact of them, you know, what they can do as far as returning back to the field, back to Kiribati. So please, uh, please be in prayer there. Um, you know, uh, he, he spent some time, Joel did, passing out the, the Kiribati Bibles that were printed, uh, getting a buy. Uh, ordained there, and I think a lot of good things going on. Um, you know, so certainly there's a blessing, and a lot of things happen in there. But if I would, if you would, please, just let's uh, let's continue to hold them up. Maybe just pray some special time this week for Bennett and for that situation, if you will. Now, this morning, the choir's going to sing. <laughs> Thank you.
All right, let's take our hymn books one more time and uh, turn to hymn number 223. Great hymn, great message to the hymn. Hymn 223, take time to be holy. Let's go ahead and stand as we sing. Time to be holy, speak up with thy Lord. Abide in him always, and we know this Take friends of God's children, help those who are weak. Forgetting in nothing is blessing. singing watch again be seated this morning brother bill's gonna come and sing for us above all powers above all kings Above all nature and all created things, you're the wisdom and all the ways of man. You were here before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, Above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there's no way to measure what you're worth. Crucified, laid behind a stone, you live to die. Rejected and alone like a rose, trampled on the ground. You took the fall and you thought of me above all. Above all kingdoms, Above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there's no way to measure what you're worth. Crucified, laid behind a stone, 
you live to die, rejected and alone like a rose, trampled on the ground, you took the fall and you thought of me above all. Crucified, laid behind a stone, you live to die, rejected and alone like a rose, trampled on the ground, you took the fall. And you thought of me above all, like a rose trampled on the ground. You took the fall, and you thought of me above all. You know, the Bible talks about what is man that thou art mindful of him. And then it talks about also in another verse how great are the sum of the thoughts that he has towards us. And I really believe that verse is individual. <laughs> I don't think he's talking about he has thoughts about a bunch of people around the planet. I think, I think you really need to personalize that and think how many times God's thoughts are towards you. You, could, you think about that, it'll really help you out. So, But I appreciate seeing everybody this morning. We're going to have Brother Kevin Hazlett come on up and preach for us this morning. Brother, appreciate you being here. Give us what the Lord's laid on your heart. Be the church, church. Well, very good. As was mentioned, my name is Kevin Hazlett, and uh, my wife, uh, Sarah, is with me this morning, as well as my daughter, Cadence. Uh, we've been married for uh, a little over 16 years and, uh, and Cadence uh, is 12 years old and is in uh, the sixth grade. And it's, uh, we're from Raleigh, North Carolina, and, uh, but really originally from Pennsylvania, but my wife and I both. I grew up around uh, Titusville, Oil City area. Some of you might be familiar with that. And then my wife's from a little further uh, down closer to Pittsburgh um, you know, by the airport direction. And, uh, but we've been in North Carolina about the last 11 years now. And, uh, and, but it's our privilege just to be with you all this morning. I know I got a chance to shake a lot of your hands, uh, uh, and I'll try to get the rest of you after church. But uh, really, it's, it's just truly our privilege uh, to be here in church. And, and it's always uh, exciting uh, any time that you get a chance to travel, and then you get to, uh, to be in a church maybe that you've never been to before, and you go in, maybe you've been on vacation, right, and you just dropped in at a random church, or you're visiting family or something, you go to their church, and you go and you find that there are other brothers and sisters in Christ who believe just like you believe, who, uh, who are going through some of the same trials, some of the same struggles, but there's that commonality, right? And there's just there's something about that, that bondhood uh, uh, that, that we have with brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and really, uh, I, I like to think about it this way, too. When I think about uh, our church back home in, in Raleigh, North Carolina, I've, I'm, I'm an associate pastor there at Beacon Baptist Church. And, and we have people from all walks of life, from all different backgrounds. And outside of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we all may have lived and died and never met each other. And think about even that and the people in this room. Uh, if it not, we're not for Christ, I mean, there's some relatives, some relations and stuff, but out, outside of that, many of us maybe would have never even met each other, but we come together this morning to worship a common Savior. And man, uh, he is a worthy Savior. I mean, this, wasn't the singing just great this morning from every part, from the congregationals, the choir just did awesome. And thank you, Brother Bill. Looking that way, he's not over there. Left me hanging. <laughs> he's in there. Oh, he's up there. There he is. He's looking, he's looking up, looking down on me from above. <laughs> and uh, so... Appreciate Brother Bill uh, singing that song for us. It's a great song, but uh, at any rate. So as I mentioned there, I'm an associate pastor over at Beacon Baptist Church. And uh, we've been there just uh, over, a little over five years now. I guess coming up on close on six years. And, 
And uh, I apologize if, if you saw me, I was texting in Sunday school. I try, try not to do too much of that. I was putting out some fires uh, this morning. We do our, our bus ministry. And then so we had you know, buses going all over the place this morning. And then we bring them, we, have, we call it uh, our bus Sunday school classes. And so, uh, of course, it, when it's a, you pick a week that you're not there, and that's also the week that everybody else is not going to be there. So I'm piecing. you got substitute teachers and substitute bus workers and stuff. And, and there was a little bit of chaos and confusion this morning. It always happens when you're not there. Uh, but uh, so I do that. I work with our, our college ministry uh, there uh, we have this little college, uh, NC State. Y'all, if you've heard, heard of them, uh, right there in Raleigh. And so I'm a little bit of a Wolfpack fan. And it was a, it was a great run for us for a few weeks. I don't know if anybody saw, but we did actually lose to the mighty Purdue Boilermakers yesterday. But, uh, uh, but anyway, um, and so we, I work with uh, some students right there on the campus, NC State. And then uh, we also are, are outreach there at the church I oversee. And so, uh, but anyway, that's just a, l- a little bit about me and, and who we are, but I would just appreciate the, uh, the privilege that I have to stand here this, e- this rather this morning, <laughs> this, today, whatever it, it is, whatever time of day it is, um, to stand here the, uh, today and open up the Word of God and uh, share with you what I believe the Lord has laid on my heart for, for the hour. And so uh, we'll be in Mark 10 here in just a minute, in just a couple of minutes. If you want to go ahead and start turning there, you can. But as we get started here... Uh, share with you, you may have heard this, maybe not, but when New Jersey teacher Marie Murphy, she got a call telling her that her house was on fire. And as most of us would do, she promptly dropped everything and rushed to the scene. Now, she wasn't scared for anybody's life because she already knew that her husband and her mother who was staying with her, they'd already safely made it out of the house. Instead, Miss Murphy was determined to save her most prized possessions. And not even a raging inferno was going to stand in her way. What was so important that Miss Murphy would literally risk burning to death to salvage? Her beloved baseball tickets. (laughs) More specifically, her season tickets to the Philadelphia Phillies. And so heroically ignoring every single one of her other possessions, Murphy reached her baseball tickets and made it out just in time to see everything else that she owned go up in flames. Now, although Murphy and her husband, they were forced to live in a motel for a little while, and uh, at least they were able to settle everything with their insurance company, but Murphy um, was even surprised at her school, though, by the Phillies fanatic, their mascot, who came to see her. And he brought with him some some other Phillies merchandise and even gave her a little framed World Series ticket. But uh, it was probably around this time, though, that Miss Murphy realized just how ridiculous her rescue mission had had been when she was told by the Phillies personnel that were there that they would have gladly just reprinted her tickets had she lost them. She's like, oh, really? (laughs) But uh, you ever look at somebody, or maybe yourself, let's just be honest, and be like, I think I've got my priorities a little mixed up. Uh, I think, Miss Murphy, this, that was the case. Well, if we really ever want to truly discover what our priorities really are, let, just look at how you spend your most valuable assets, your time uh, and your treasure. But Mark, in Mark chapter 10, y'all are, are there already we're reading just a minute, but this morning we're going to look at a man who got a reality check from the Savior. He seemed like that he had it all together except where it really mattered. And, you know, if we're honest, isn't that a little bit how, how we are? We are really good at putting things together on the outside. We can put nice clothes on and, and come to church and put a smile and shake hands. I mean, I love that. It's one of my favorite parts uh, about church is just is greeting folks and, and asking them about their week and that sort of thing. But meanwhile, on the inside, you're, you're, we're falling apart at times. Let's just, let's just be honest. And as we examine this man's brief encounter with Christ, we're going to talk about the idea of making and then keeping Jesus Christ first place, giving him that first priority in our lives. You know, understand, we, we all know that he wants that, he doesn't just want to be that 911 call when we need him at the last moment. He wants that place of first priority. And you may be sitting here thinking, well, that seems pretty elementary. And, and it is, perhaps, but... But isn't it interesting that so many other things are constantly 
vying for that positioning in our lives. And, and oftentimes they creep in unsuspectingly. We find ourselves, in, in so, we find ourselves uh, allowing other things in that place of preeminence that's meant for Christ alone. And so let's look at the Word of God this morning in Mark chapter 10. Uh, we'll pick up in verse uh, 17. The Bible says this, And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And he answered unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest. Go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. Let's pause here for a moment. We'll uh, pray, ask the Lord to bless the message, and we'll continue on. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you so much for uh, just the opportunity uh, to stand here. Lord, I'm truly humbled at the, the privilege to open up your word, to share a few thoughts, Lord. And I pray that it'll be a help to some folks. Uh, I pray that you uh, help us to, this morning to lay aside any distractions that we may have brought in this morning. Uh, things that might be on our mind just for a few moments to hone in on what your, what your word says and what you have for us. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would uh, just bind Satan this morning. I pray that your Holy Spirit will be free to work as you see fit. And we ask these things today in Jesus' name. Amen. You see, here was a person that we see here that came before Jesus who literally seemingly had the world at his fingertips. You know, we can liken him really to maybe a, a social media influencer uh, of our day or maybe some, some corp, young corporate executive who's you know, quickly climbing the ranks of the, of the corporate ladder and, and has just achieved tremendous success. And even at a young age, he would have been probably on all of the, the podcasts and, and all the daily TV shows, probably, perhaps, you know, asking him, hey, how, do you, how did you do what you're able to do? And even at such a, a young age, right, just we could probably liken him to people like that that we encounter in society today. The man that, that we see here in Scripture uh, we learned this about him, really. There's three different accounts in the Gospels that, that, that share this account, this encounter uh, with Christ. From our text here in Mark 10, we see that he was a, um, we see that he was rich. If we were to flip over to Matthew's account of this, we see that he was a, actually a young man. We don't learn that from here, but Matthew does tell us that here was a young man. And if you were to jump over to Luke's account of the same story, you would see, you would learn that he is a ruler. And so by putting the three together, we find we, we get what we know him as is the rich, young ruler who came to Jesus Christ and uh, with some questions. And, and uh, as we look at several things about him this morning, the first one that I want to draw our attention to is back in verse 17. It says this, uh, it says he came forth in the way, he came running and he kneeled to him. The first thing I want us to notice is his longing. You see, I mentioned here he had great material wealth, but really even more significant than that, we might think, well, big deal. Lots of people in our day and age have lots of great wealth, lots of wealth but, but in his day and age, it was much more uncommon. There was, he didn't live in the land of opportunity like we do, and, and, and so for him to have that wealth and the status that he already had was a much rarer thing uh, than our day. Every physical thing that a person could desire, he had it right there. At his fingertips. He had the position and the notoriety that, that so many people crave. People respected this young man. And yet somehow, in spite of all that he had managed to amass in his short life, he knew that deep down something was missing in his life. You know, like all Jews, like all good Jews, he probably would have believed in, a, in an afterlife... Um, and he knew that, that death would eventually come knocking. But here's the thing. Deep down, he knew that he was not ready to answer. And so uh, he was longing to know 
uh, the answer about his own, his own eternity. And, and you see, like, and even for us in our, our day and age, like the elephant in the room that none of us like to talk about. We don't like to talk about death, uh, but it, we understand that it's a reality. Uh, that it, death is batting a, a thousand so far. Uh, unless the Lord tarries his returns, we, that's the direction we are all headed. We don't like to talk about it, but here's the thing, and none of us are guaranteed that today won't be our turn. I mean, let, let's just be honest. And, and so how about us this morning? Can we identify with the, this, this young man just a little bit uh, in the fact that maybe you've, we, we've achieved a little bit of success the way the world would, would view it? Uh, maybe, but though that deep down in a place where only you and God can see, you know that something is missing from your life. Or maybe you're like this young man, you're, you wonder, what is it that's waiting for you in the afterlife? And in our verse, the opening verse there, we get a sense of the desperation that exists in this young man. Um, you know, he, 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 he must have been feeling over this over his, his own condition, knowing full well that in spite of his possessions, in spite of his position, and even in spite of his religion, this this thought of his own mortality, of his own eternity, was gnawing at him. And so when the opportunity presented itself he, uh, for, for him to meet this man, Jesus, this great teacher and this great preacher that he had heard about, he said uh, he was not going to miss it. And so here's what he does. Our text says, look, he says he'd gone forth into the way that came. What did he do? He came running and he kneeled to him. You know, he didn't, for a minute, he forgot about his fancy, expensive clothes. For a minute, he forgot about who else might have been looking around and seeing. And he falls at the feet of Jesus. And the, the question that had been gnawing in his mind and in his heart comes up to the front of his mind and out of his lips. And what does he say? Good master, what must I do? that I may inherit eternal life. And so we see in this young man a longing, a longing to know the truth about eternity. So I want us to notice in our second point this morning something about the way that he asks the question. Let's look at how he words in verses, um, here in verse uh, 18 there. It says, um, or verse 17 says, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Now, this is a common question, but really an uncommon way of asking it. If you look at it, he says inherit, but he says I've got to do to inherit. It's a bit of an oxymoron here. You see, inheritance has nothing to do with what we do, has nothing to do with uh, our performance, but rather our position. My, my daughter is, she, Lord willing, someday will inherit all, the, all of my change, all my pocket change, <laughs> um, whatever I've got there. That last day, you know, a couple bucks of it um, in a dish somewhere. But, you know, that will be in her inheritance. But that will not be based upon what she has done over the course of her life. It is strictly and only on the basis that she is my child. And so the, the young man, he's like, what do I have to do to inherit? Well, he's missing something here. He's lacking in his, in his knowledge that there's nothing that must be done to inherit. So already we see he's lacking in some understanding See, his, his desire, I truly believe his desire was right, and I think Jesus saw that. But his focus on doing was all wrong. You see, that was really pretty normal for their day. Uh, they, they had to, they, there was so much doing and working. All of humanity, really, outside of Bible-believing Christianity, believes that there's something that we've got to do to earn the, the acceptance uh, of whatever deity that the rest of the world uh, believes in. But we understand that there's so much focus on doing when in God's economy, everything is already done. Aren't you thankful for that? We just came out of the Easter season and celebrated what Jesus already did for us. The payment has already been made. And so the work is done, but he, missed, he it was missing that. And the problem, though, also with this good works idea of salvation is that really, truly it prevents us, us presents a superficial view of our sin and, and really of, of Christ's sacrifice and even the Bible. You see, sin is an act of rebellion against our holy creator. When, it, when we boil down to it, it's what it is. But, it's, but it extends more to, than just our outward actions. It's a manifestation of what's going on on the inside. 
of the, the sin, the rebellion that's already there. It's an, of an attitude that exalts self and lowers God. Really, at its core, that's what sin is. And so as sinners, we tend to minim minimize the severity of it, right? Let's just be honest. You've gotten in trouble with, you, with your parents as a kid. You're like, well, it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't all that bad. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, just, it's just human nature. I think we see that with all the students in school and stuff. It, they won't admit, they'll admit to maybe 50% of what they did. But you get to the truth of the matter. It's like, oh, no, it was actually a lot worse than what you led on. But, but understand this, that's just our human nature. But when we can see sin as God views sin... Uh, we might, I'm sorry, we must do that, understanding too that really his opinion is the one that matters. And so did this man, this young man, really think that just a few good deeds uh, was going to settle his account with a holy God? You see, look at, let's look next at Jesus' response. It's an interesting response, honestly. Uh, but Jesus answers his question with a question. And it's always good to, we see that Jesus, he's good at that. I mean, he's just a master at just pulling things out of, out of people. And, he, you know, uh, and, and so he answers the question with a question. He says, why callest thou me good? He says, there's none good uh, but one, and that is God. He says, why do you, Jesus says, why, do you, why are you calling me good? Because, see, customarily in that time, a rabbi would not accept that terminology. They would not accept being good. In their, in their day and age, the context really for good applied to, it was more of an absolute term. And that's what Jesus is trying to ex help him to understand. Wait a second, you're calling me good. There's only one good, and that's God. And so Jesus doesn't deny, understand this, look, it's, it's clear, it's interesting phrasing, but Jesus does not deny the title. In fact, I believe he's affirming it. I believe what Jesus is doing here is he wanted the young man to be sure that he understood just what it was that he's saying. He wanted to uh, know the implications involved if he's willing to accept that Jesus really is on the same plane as God. And, and so that we're talking about getting, putting Jesus in the first place that he deserves. You see, here's the thing about me making Jesus, putting Jesus in that position, is that we've got to first admit that Jesus is God. He's more than just a genie to grant our wishes. He's more than just somebody to come in and fix our mistakes. He's more than just a moral teacher or some great motivational speaker. Jesus says in John 10, verse 30, says, I and my Father are one. He is the Son of God. We, we cannot lower him to, to being just like some other man, some other great teacher like uh, many other religions do. I think of the, the Mormons and, 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 and Muslims and others, other religions around the world. Well, they'll, they'll admit, they'll freely admit, hey, Jesus was a... a he, he changed the world that he lived in. Man, he was a, a, just this great teacher, but they fall short of calling him God. It reminds me of, uh, have you ever heard of what was known you know, among, um, you know, in, in an apologetic world with people who uh, work to defend the faith? They call it a trilemma. It's a fancy way of saying it, but it really just means this, is that uh, C.S. Lewis, you guys are you know, familiar with C.S. Lewis, he... Um, Chronicles of Narnia and, and Mere Christianity is a famous author and, and whatnot, but um, he proposed what's known as that, that trilemma, and here's what it is. He said that Jesus must be one of three things. Uh, we've got to accept one of the three. He said he is either liar, either he has, when he, in his claim, he's, he's very clear throughout the word of God that he claims to be God. He said, so we've got to either come to the admission, maybe he was lying about what he said, Okay. Secondly, maybe he's just a lunatic. Maybe he really did believe he was God, but he was not. And so he's going around. So in either of those two cases, he's not just a good moral teacher. Jesus doesn't leave the position op open for us uh, to just settle with that. So we're either we're, we have to be willing and, and come to the terms, say, Jesus, well, either you're a liar, either you're a lunatic, or thirdly, the only other option is that you are who you say you are, and you are Lord. And so, and that's what we have to help our community and those around us to understand. See, many people will say, yeah, he's a good person. Yeah, I probably should be. I probably should go to church. I probably should do this. Yeah, yeah, But, but they, they fall short. And so what is a great way, if you're a great witnessing tool, to say, well, either Jesus was lying when he claimed he very, very made it very evident, or he is nuts, he's a lunatic, or he is Lord. And, and so, uh, very powerful, and I believe Jesus was trying to get this young man to understand that he is equal with God. Now, 
So getting back to the man's line of questioning about what he could do to get eternal life, it's interesting that Jesus continues his response by giving him the law of Moses. Now, do we, do we think Jesus is advocating keeping the commandments as a way of salvation. Of course, we would say that that's not the case. That's not the whole teaching on the whole counsel of God. So what must he, he must be doing something else here then. You see, Jesus, I don't believe, brought up the commandments to tell the young man how to be saved. I believe he brought that up to show the man that he needed to be saved. You see, the law, one of the reasons that it was given was to act as a mirror and to show us our shortcomings, to show us that it was impossible to keep the law in every point. And see, God's standard of goodness is something that none of us can attain. The mirror of the law only shows us how dirty we are. It cannot clean us up. Only grace can do that. And so, ama um, amazingly, though, his response, look at his response in verse 20. Master, all these have I observed from my youth up. He, he says, I've observed them all carefully. So even if we grant him that, okay, which we know in reality, just like we said, human nature is to minimize and to maximize our goodness. Uh, even if we grant him that he kept them all externally, we know that Jesus taught according to God's true meaning of the law that these also apply to issues of the heart. And if we're honest, that's where all of us begin to fall short. And so maybe you've... Uh, been out witnessing, and, and just as another way of trying to help us to understand just how we fall short. Maybe you're like, yeah, I don't need any help with that. <laughs> I, I'm perfectly, I, I'll admit, I fall short every day. But it, I do run into people periodically who have a hard time grasping the fact that a loving God could send people to hell, right? They, they have a hard time with that and, and understanding that maybe that they're not bad enough to deserve hell, well, here's, here's another way to help people understand. And I, um, I didn't come up with this. There's a, another guy that he's, he, he, um, he actually posts, shares a lot of his stuff on, on YouTube, that, his stuff that he's witnessing. And here's how he, he goes about when he's uh, giving the gospel out on the streets to people. He goes to what Jesus does and goes to the heart of the issue and, and, and trying to get them to understand the fact that they are a sinner. He's asked them, say, well, hey, have, have you ever lied? And well, yeah, yeah, I guess, I guess that I'm, I'm a, I guess I have lied in the past. Okay, well, let's just move on. Secondly, have, have you ever stolen anything, no matter how small? And most people admit, yeah, maybe as a kid I stole a pencil or uh, something. He said, okay, all right. So, all right, moving on. H have you ever taken the Lord's name in vain? You know, that's just common verbiage out in society these days. Uh, and, and he says, have you ever taken the Lord's name in vain? And and, and we think about, it, well, what's, yeah, but maybe what's so wrong with that? And he, uh, he'll share, well, you know, the Lord's name is to be honored and respected. You wouldn't use your mother's name as a curse word. And, and so God's name is way higher than your mother's name. And so the Bible says that that's blasphemy, okay? And so he continues on. He says, okay, have you ever hated somebody? Has there ever been somebody where you've just, you just absolutely hated them, couldn't stand them? He says, well, the Bible likens that to murder. And they're like, okay, okay. And so he says, by your own admission, here's where he, then he turns it around on him. He says, okay, by your own admission, you are a lying, thieving, blaspheming murderer at heart. <laughs> and, uh, and they're like, wow, you're right. I guess you're right. I, I do. Uh, that, because it is, it's the heart of the matter. Our heart is at the heart of the matter. And so how, in spite of this young man's unwillingness to admit any wrongdoing, though, Jesus still senses in him an earnestness. Because there's still, he still recognizes, hey, this young man had forgotten about everything else around him. He came to Jesus, came to the right person. And as amazingly, Jesus says this in verse 21, Jesus beholding him loved him. Aren't you thankful this morning for Romans 5, 8? This says, but God commendeth, or God extended his love toward us. And that while we're, we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Whew. Jesus looked at this young man here and he saw that, that he was misguided. He was mistaken. Yes, he, he had fallen into sin and, uh, and, and that, he, that he was condemned. But, but the Bible says that Jesus loved 
him. And aren't you so thankful? I have anything else this morning for us to walk away with. I'm thankful this morning that Jesus loves us. Just like Brian said, making it personal. I love John 3.16, the greatest verse in all of the Bible. For God so loved the world. You know, I'm sharing that with, when I share that truth with other people, I love to take out that word world there, and I like to put their name in it. I like to put my name right there. For God so loved Kevin that he gave. Because here's the thing, I truly and honestly believe that if I was the only person in the world, not that I'm anybody special, but I believe if me or any one of us were the only person in the world who needed saving, that Jesus would have left heaven, he would have gone all the way to the cross, and he would have died and suffered all that he suffered because he loves us that much. But it's amazingly, Jesus looks at this young man, and the word of God records, without mistake here, Jesus beholding him loved him. And so let's look here. Well, let me back up just a second. Jesus said to this young man, you appear to have everything, but there's one thing. Look at verse 21. One thing thou lackest. He says, there's one thing you are missing. And unfortunately, it's the one thing that you're missing that makes everything else pale by comparison. It was a matter of the heart. And this rich young man had a glaring deficiency in his heart that, this, that Jesus had to first expose. And let's look and see just what that is. He hasn't gotten to really to, to the heart of it just yet. Because this, here's what he tells him to do. He says, one thing thou lackest, go thy way. Sell whatsoever thy ha thou hast and give to the poor. And then thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come take up your cross and follow me. Now, the, this verse is not meant to be taken that this is a requirement for eternal life. Here we all say amen. Um, and, but here's the thing. Jesus needed to show this young man that he, in fact, did not own great possessions, but rather those great possessions owned him. How no man has ever missed heaven for simply having great possessions. But how many men have missed heaven because those great possessions had a great hold on them. You see, to this young man, money was his God. He was trusting in it. He worshipped it. Maybe he, didn't, maybe he didn't have an idol of wood or stone, but his possessions and, and his position of notoriety, those were the things that stood in the way of making Jesus Christ first place in his life. You see, that's where he found his sense of security and identity in. He loved it. And so his morals, he may have been a very moral person. It appears that he was, but here's the problem. All that they were doing was masking the idolatry that had sprung up inside of his heart. And just like us, we, we, we can do that. We can, we can uh, be, be very good on the, inside, on the outside where everybody else sees and, and say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, no, sir, no, ma'am, and be polite and all those things. But inside, there's some very real idols that we have allowed to be built up inside of our own hearts. If we'll be perfectly honest with ourselves. And so Jesus here, he tears back the veil of this self-righteous man, exposing the evil that had grown up in a place where nobody else could see. And so can I just politely just, 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 just challenge us this morning, encourage us what may be here, here this morning, and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord, as first place. You've never ex received the free gift of salvation is like this young man, is there something that would be standing in your way? Would there be something that you would say, you know what, yes, I have, I'm willing to, I know that, I, that, I'm, that I've sinned, I know that, that there's something that is between, that my sin is between me and Jesus, and I'm willing to lay it aside to accept him and make him the Lord of my life. Or maybe here uh, this morning, you're here and you are a believer, but, and, and it happens, it's, it's the reality of the world that we live in, is that things creep in. Slowly, it's not always, uh, overt or even intentional, but just sometimes things creep in that, that take that place. You see, only you and God may know what it is that the Holy Spirit is maybe starting to zero in on your heart this morning. Perhaps it's a God or an idol of, of, of entertainment uh, or lust or success like this young man or money, achievement. You know, family can even become an idol and that's hard to say because we love our families. Uh, but, but when they take the place of 
lordship, of, of the first place of priority in our lives, uh, then, then they can become an idol. Or maybe it's just self. But with that, there's so many other custom-tailored gods and idols that we can set up in our own hearts that we create that keep us from full surrender to Jesus Christ. You see, it wasn't just his possessions, but it was also his pride that Jesus identifies here. He says, sell whatever you have, but then the last thing he says there is, come and take up the cross and follow me. Can I just remind us this morning that self-sufficiency is the enemy of spiritual progress. We walk in here, so many things that we try to do, we try to do on our own. We try to handle it, but God, I got this, I got this. And then when it crumbles, eventually, like the, it always inevitably does, then we go to God. And so that's what oftentimes is keeping us from making spiritual progress. Here's the, the Paul said it this way. He says, I die, what do you say? Daily. Daily. Here's what I mean. It is a daily surrender. You see, dead men don't have their own, their own list of, of, of things that they have to have in their lives. Uh, they are, Jesus on the cross is subject to, he, to, to whatever. And so when Jesus is saying, hey, take up your cross, you are saying, hey, it is not, like Paul also, not I, but Christ. God, what do you have for me? I belong to you. I surrender myself to you for whatever you have for me today. And in every day, and as often as it takes throughout our days, we ought to be willing to lay aside ourselves for a worthy Savior and for His cause and say, God, what do you have for me today? Lastly, this morning, let's look, let's look down here in verse 22 to see the final thing that we notice about this young man. Verse 22, he says this, he was sad at that saying, he was grieved. And that last thing we notice here is his loss. You see, only as far as I can tell from the Bible, only one man ever walked away from the feet of Jesus in worse condition than when he arrived. Jesus promised him the treasures of heaven if he'd be willing to lay down the temporary treasures of earth. Man, what an opportunity. But yet in his instance, what a squandered chance. You know, how often are we guilty of sacrificing the eternal on the altar of the immediate? You know, every time that we choose fear and keep it and let it keep us from witnessing to somebody, uh, we, uh, we miss out on another treasure. Um, every time that we choose not to give back on t- to God and, and live in generosity, we miss out on God's best and miss out on God's blessings. Uh, and so there's so many ways that, that, that sometimes we fail to, to, to live in light of eternity. You see, this young man, he came at the right time. He came when he was still young. He came to the right person. He ran and the Bible says he ran and knelt at the feet of Jesus. He even asked the right question about eternal life. And he received the right answer. Jesus said, forsake your sin, take up your cross and follow me. But he made the wrong choice. He turned away from the Lord and walked away in sorrow and in shame. And so by choosing the temporary treasure of earth, he lost out on the eternal riches of heaven, making the worst deal in all of eternity. And so may I just challenge us this morning, let's not make the same mistake in our lives. Uh, Jesus calls us to surrender. Let's give him that first place that he deserves. Uh, and, and here's the thing, he deserves and then he blesses. He promises him to, he promises to say, don't, I'm not just asking you to give up everything and you walk away with nothing. He says, you give up just these little things that you have, these little trinkets. Look at, really, for honest, in the light of all eternity, these little trinkets. And he says, you give up those few little things, and I will, in fact, God says it elsewhere. He says, see if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. And so, I ask this morning, is like the rich young man, is there one thing, Jesus says, there's just one thing thou lack. Is there one thing that's holding you back today from surrender, from maybe from accepting Jesus as your Savior, or maybe from, uh, from maybe saying this morning, you know what, uh, it's been a tough week, I've had a lot of things going on, and, and I, uh, maybe this morning, my, the, all that I, I just have cr- maybe crowded Jesus out a little bit. 
I've not made the time for him like I should have. And so maybe that's where you find yourself this morning. But, but I wonder this morning, is, does Jesus have first place? Decide today that nothing is worth holding back from the Savior. With that, we're gonna uh, let's all have everybody stand. We'll close out. We'll, uh, we'll have a word, an invitation. We'll have the pianist come and play. But as she's coming to play for us <clears throat> this morning, Jesus, the first thing he needed that young man to understand that he is Lord. And <clears throat> the Bible does say in Romans ten thirteen. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so, <clears throat> as the pianist plays this, this morning, here's what I'd like to ask. Just in the privacy of the moment, with heads bowed and eyes closed, maybe you'd be willing to say, you know what? There's never been a time in my life where I've called upon Him as Lord. I've been trying to do things my own way. I've, I, I, I've maybe, like this young man, hey, he was probably... In the, the, when it comes to his morality, it would have blown us out of the water. I mean, he was, was a good man, a good young man. He wasn't immoral, he wasn't anything, but he was missing one thing, and that was a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus had to show him that. I wonder if that's you this morning. Has there ever been a day, the Bible talks about being born again. You know, I can take you back to the time... Uh, uh, to a date, I don't remember, but July 31st, 1987 was the day I was physically born. But then about seven years later was the day that I was spiritually born. Has there ever been a day you've been born again, a day, a time that you've trusted Christ? And then for the believers in the room, and uh, maybe just in the privacy there, um, where you stand, or if there's an altar here, feel free to use it, but you don't have to. There's just something about coming down front that just kind of, uh, just just solidifies it between you and, and God. But, but it's not necessary. You can pray right there where you stand and say, just between you and the Lord, if I'm perfectly honest, yeah, I've, I've allowed some other things, maybe other good things. See, see, the devil is a master at taking good things and, and you, making us so that we usurp them and become the first thing, the priority in our lives. And so if you're willing, honest with yourself and with the Lord, say, you know, I've, I've allowed some things to creep into my life this week, into my heart, that have taken the place that only belongs to Jesus. What will it take for us to loosen our grip and what holds us back from spiritual victory? Bowing before Christ. Complete surrender. You see, unlike the young man, the rich young ruler, we don't have to walk out of this building this morning in sorrow. We don't have to walk, walk out of here with regret. We can walk away rejoicing today. We serve a worthy Savior who has already offered forgiveness. He's offered His love full and free, but the choice is ours. Brother Brian.